Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're on board the University of Hawaii research vessel Kilo Moana to study the open ocean food web from microscopic particles to big fishes like tuna and mahi-mahi. We learn about the equipment scientists use to sample the environment from the deep sea to the surface. And we learn what it's like to spend two weeks studying science at sea. Let's meet chief scientist, oceanographer, Jeff Drazen. I'm Jeff, I'm your chief scientist. Uh, my focus is uh, trophic ecology and energetics of deep sea fish. I think everybody knows the overall goals of the project. And if they don't by now, they understand that this is sort of a food web uh, project and we are trying to sample everything from low molecular weight, dissolved materials, all the way up to tunas. So yes, there will be fishing on this trip. <laughs> Specialized marine technicians maintain daily operations and equipment on board research vessels like the Kilo Moana. Lead marine tech Trevor Goodman shows us around and explains how some of this large ocean-going gear works. Well, Trevor, you're the lead technician for the Kilo Moana. Can you tell me a little bit about what that means? Okay, so the lead technician, what we usually do is we help coordinate the project with the science personnel and the ship personnel. We're kind of the go-between people. Um, we do a lot of coordination, and we also take care of all the scientific equipment. We have our own uh, CTD on board, and we're bringing a mock nest, and we help run that equipment and kind of train the science party personnel how to use it. And we're kind of like, kind of like science roadies. We're just here to help them get their science project done, and we just help them as much as we can. So you're kind of like a scientist and an engineer sort of put together? Yeah, it's a science engineer kind of mishmash together. So what's going on back here? Oh, so earlier today they, um, they replaced a part on the A-frame, so now they're just testing it out to make sure it's still working. And that's the A-frame there, the big green structure. Yeah, yeah. The, the a, that's a real critical piece of equipment right there because the CTD and the mock nest all get launched from the A-frame. The winch and the wire come up one side into the middle block and then down. So everything that goes in the water goes through the water from the A-frame. Would you mind showing me around some of the locations on the boat where you operate out of? Yeah. This is the hydro lab. This is where um, the science party sets up their equipment. It's these scientists setting up now. Scientists in action. <laughs> and this is the uh, CTD lab. This is where we can um, connect. Our computers are hooked up to the CTD and the mock nest systems. On the, the CTD, that's your conductivity, temperature, depth meter that sort of collects water, goes over the side of the boat. It's yeah, that's our water sampling device. And then the mock nest also comes into here as well, so you can watch it. And that's uh, Megan right there. She's a tech from Scripps. Hi, Megan. And Hi. she's in charge of the 10 meter mock nest. And she's pretty awesome, really lucky to have her around. Next, marine technician Megan Donahue shows us one of the most important pieces of science research equipment to this project, the mock nest net. The mock nest is a multiple opening and closing system for collecting plankton from specific depths, allowing researchers to separate samples from deep, mid, and shallow water organisms. Let me do a stage prop for you guys to make things a little bit easier. So what I'm doing here is called cocking the net, uh -huh. and um, basically this is the net tripping motor, and this all has the nets open. This bar will be dropped down to the bottom, and this is going to be where the mouth of the net is, and it's going to be streaming out back this way. So all the fishes are coming in from this way, and we're catching them in the cotton. And then what happens is when they say they're all done sampling in the depth range that they're at, we in the computer room, send down the signal to turn this motor, which turns this dial and then gets to one more step, pops it, the net slides down, 
closes uh -huh. and we're able to section off which critters we're going to get from which section. So each set of bars will have a net on it. So this is bottom of the net, top of the net, top of the net, bottom of the net. And so they all work together in order to sample discreetly so that they're able to get the critters that they need from specific depths, which is really important to be able to do uh, different studies. And so the way the net works is always fishing, right? Always as, fishing. as one closes, the next one simultaneously opens, opens up. Mm -hmm. All of the important stuff is right in here. These are all the sensors and you don't want to damage them in any way whatsoever. Um, and we also had uh, new pieces built by the machine shop. And so when this is all rigged up with its nets and it's ready to go overboard, how is that going to work? So when this is all rigged up, the, all of these net bars will be pulled up and hooked into the uh, trip mechanism there. And the bottom bar will be slid all the way down with a ver very first net open. What we do then is uh, we individually lower each net's cod end into the water. Um, and the reason you do it individually and you lower it versus chucking them over is um, the cod ends are just made out of PVC. It's thick PVC, but they bash together and they crack and then you don't get your sample. Oh, no. And so if you come back up and you have a cracked sample uh, collection, then you can't use it. So then it goes down to the depth that we need it to. We adjust the ship's speed as needed, make sure that the angles of everything is correct. This has to fly at a 45 degree angle. It can go down to 30 degrees and up to 60 degrees, but if you go outside of that range, the nets aren't open properly and they're not fishing correctly. So um, we play with the ship's speed, the currents, the speed of the wire, all of that in order to get this to be in that perfect zone for them to get their sample. research, as I understand, is to look at the zooplankton. Yes, that's uh, exactly right. So um, I'm focusing on the zooplankton, and they're important because they're actually that trophic link between the particles that we're collecting uh -huh. and um, the, uh, the fish that we'll be collecting with a, a larger uh, mock nest net. And so can you tell me kind of what is zooplankton? Well, zooplankton um, is actually a group of organisms that um, generally are thought to sort of drift with the currents. They can sort of swim on their own. The majority of the zooplankton in this region of the world's oceans are actually very small crustaceans uh, called copepods. You're going to be collecting them with this net you have here, this mock nest net? That's, that's right. So this is um, what's called a one meter mock nest net. And this is a great sampling device for collecting zooplankton because um, it can actually uh, collect zooplankton at different depth levels in the water column. It has a series of 10 nets on the system and um, the nets can close one after the other so you can get discrete depth intervals uh, sampled. What are the challenges that you face um, in the next 10 days as you're at sea? Well, I think that it's going to be a very busy towing schedule, actually, because um, uh, we are going to be deploying the mock nests for these very long um, tow times down to 1,500 meters. And then we'll be processing the samples immediately afterwards, and then we'll go right back into another tow. So it's going to be kind of a continuous cycle for a number of days. And you're going to be going all the way from the surface down to like 1,500 meters. That's correct. So we're doing actually a fairly deep tow. We're going to be going from the surface to 1,500 meters, and then we're going to be coming slowly up from 1,500 meters and collect, collecting zooplankton at different depth intervals along the way as the net comes back up through the water. And so you're holding this jar there, and I assume somehow you're going to take the zooplankton you've collected in the net and get it in the jar. How are you going to do that? 
That's exactly right. So there are several processing steps that occur after uh, we collect the zooplankton. So the zooplankton are collected in large nets, but they funnel down into a cod end, which is about a foot tall. And then we take the cod end into the lab and um, uh, sort of process the zooplankton. And eventually, um, this group of very small animals can fit in these uh, jars, and we, we uh, take them back to the lab to study them. And what are you going to be looking for as part of this research? Well, we're actually interested in uh, several target uh, zooplankton. So from the zooplankton that's preserved in these jars, we're going to look for select target taxa. And we're going to um, sort out this taxa and then analyze them for stable isotope uh, composition. And that stable isotope composition is fitting into the understanding of how the food web is working between these deep water organisms and the surface. That's exactly correct. We uh, expect to see that there is a distinct deep water stable isotope signal that most likely will be present in uh, the zooplankton collected in deep waters. And that signal is actually quite different from the stable isotope composition or signal that we see in the surface waters. So that's, that's really exciting. The zooplankton that you're collecting is actually the animals that are eating those suspended particles we've been hearing about. Exactly. So, so the, the zooplankton that I'll be collecting is that potential trophic link between the suspended particles and then in turn they're eaten by fish. So you kind of have a really key role in the whole inner workings of this research. Yeah, it's definitely an important trophic link in the food web that's necessary to study. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years. Through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. Oceanographer Brian Pope is collecting the small sinking particles from the water column. These small organic pieces of matter are an important part of the open ocean food web, and Brian explains how they are collected. Brian, what is your role in this research study? So I'm out here now at sea to help collect some of the samples, and the samples that we're concerned with in, in addition to zooplankton that swim around and the fish that swim around. It's the particles in the ocean because we think that they're kind of the base of the food web even for the, the fish and the zooplankton that live really, really deep. And there are two kinds of particles. Those that are really small and they sort of settle very, very slowly or remain suspended. And there are those that are rapidly sinking. So. We're going to put out some equipment to try to collect some of those rapidly sinking particles. And they're really just tubes that are closed at the bottom, open mm -hmm. at the top. And we're going to put those out onto a floating uh, line. And they'll sit 150 meters below the surface. And we'll collect those particles. So remember I said we were looking for particles that were sinking? Uh -huh. We trap them in these, these little tubes. We take the top off and we attach them. They just slide right on in there, and they'll sit um, vertically on a, on a uh, rope. How do you make depth. sure that it doesn't tip over? Um, those have some lines on it that stabilize it. Okay. So the, the big line fits through the slot in the top, and then there are some smaller lines that will um, pull down and pull top with a, a hose clamp, and just hose clamp that right to the, the line. And it, amazing keeps it stable and these go they slip right in here and then we just take a little bungee cord so that's how we'll collect the particles that are sinking there's 24 of them and you said they're going to go down for four or five days yep and as the particles settle they'll fall right in we put brine in there a high salt solution so it doesn't uh, slosh out so it's denser than the seawater yeah. surrounding it. And then if something, you know, that's food in there. So if a, a somebody swims into it, something swims in and goes into the brine, they don't last very long. And then we'll pick those out before we analyze the sinking particles. So we're not biasing it by the swimmers that swim in. Mm -hmm. 
what's the volume of particles that you expect to collect? Will it be visible? Yes. Yeah, you'll be able to see it in the bottom, just barely. <laughs> so it really will look like marine snow? Yes. Yeah. And this is the, the float that we're going to follow um, for the, the sediment trap array. This is a tube that will hold the radio directional finder and the strobe okay. sits in here. And then there's a radar reflector and we'll put that little GPS transmitter on here as well. And hopefully it'll all come back. Have you ever lost a piece of equipment at sea? No, no I haven't, but I lent it to somebody who sank it. Oh. <laughs> Well, hopefully that won't happen this time. Yes, keep our fingers <laughs> crossed. This is what we call a CTD. It's a, there's a conductivity, temperature, and pressure depth sensor on there. Uh -huh. There's also a variety of other instruments that tell us how much oxygen is in the water or how many particles are in the water. Um, and then they have a rosette of these 24 12 liter bottles. And we send them down with it open at the top and open at the bottom. And what we can do from the surface is send a signal down that remotely closes the top and bottom simultaneously. And in doing so, that collects the particles that are very slowly settling. Because they're, they're just suspended there. They get suspended within the bottle when you close them, you can bring them right back to the surface. So you're going to use this to collect those faster sinking particles and then the CTD to collect the suspended particles. Yes. Gotcha. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. Up next, we talk with Chief Mate Brian Wiemeyer, who explains his role in supporting science research at sea. So my name's Brian. I'm the chief mate, uh, one of the chief mates for the Kila Moana. And um, so you're associated only with this research vessel? Uh, yeah, I've been working here since about 2007, and um, I've been working pretty much exclusively for the University of Hawaii. What is your role as the chief mate? Well, as the chief mate, I'm responsible for the, the deck department. So the deck department comprises uh, the chief mate, the second mate, and the third mate. And then we have uh, six uh, deck hands, two on each watch. So each watch is a four-hour watch. So one mate uh, is responsible for the ship during that four-hour period. So when we're at sea, there's always one uh, mate up here. Uh -huh. And they have, they're licensed by the Coast Guard, and they're responsible for the ship and everything that's going on uh, for those four hours. So the captain is kind of uh, the overseer, but generally has more of a, in case of emergency, role. So up here on the bridge, this is sort of like the brains of the ship. Um, well, of course, in the deck department, we think that. <laughs> and engineers think they've got the brains oh, down sure. there. So um, we have the navigation and the ability to take the ship where it needs to go, but the engineers have to make propellers turn. So that's the age-old conundrum, you know, who's more important. So we have the nice view, and, and so we like our side of it, you know, because we can see where we're going and such. And, and usually it gets to the publicity is mostly uh, the, the captain or the, the glamorous side of things, you know. But obviously the engineering job is, is quite important. Can you tell me a little bit about maybe what's different working on a science research vessel versus a commercial uh, barge or fishing vessel? It's exceptionally more social. So really? on a commercial ship you've got basically to, to stereotype 15 guys. The, the industry is maybe 10 percent women uh -huh. and it's it when I was going to school it had come up to about 10 percent and then more or less plateaued. 
Um, so that's a general guess, but the maritime industry is, is a vastly male industry and it's, it can be pretty socially limited if you're on a small, relatively small space compared to you know, your city or your country. If you're on a pretty small vessel and that's all your social interaction is for two or three months, it can be pretty limited. Um, on a science boat, you've got you know, people from all walks of life, all different countries, races, uh, you know, sexual orientation, gender. You've got a big mix of people and uh, sometimes up to 28. We can carry up to 28 people on here on top of the 20 crew. So it, it more or less forces you not to withdraw you know, because you have to interact. It's uh -huh. a small platform. Uh, we all eat together, um, and we're all working together in a small space. You know, basically, you're you're moving in with 28 people for however long, and so it keeps people, uh, you know, much more. Their social skills stay up, I think, a lot more than they would on a on a regular ship, where um, not only is there less people, but everyone kind of keeps off to themselves. That's really interesting because a stereotype you people often think of scientists as, you know, isolated, always alone, yeah. but um, the reality is, like you're saying, that it's actually a really social um, family sort of dynamic. Yeah, I mean you're you're taking two, I guess, stereotypes, the sailor stereotype <laughs> and the science stereotype of of people going into fields where they're doing things far afield. And maybe they're doing that for a reason because they don't want to be around so much other people or, or <laughs> however you want to look at it. But putting them all together, you have this maybe kinship of isolationism mm -hmm. and, and people get along and it seems to work pretty well. That's you know? great. And the thing here is because in general, as with almost anything regarding education or science and things along those lines, the pay is not what you would get in a commercial world. So to end up here, um, you pretty much have to want to be here. If you're going to be here for any length of time, you're giving up more lucrative offers elsewhere. So people that are here generally are people that want to be here, and that gives them a much better attitude. Thanks for watching Voice of the Sea. Turn your love of the ocean into a lifelong career. Join NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as we unlock the secrets in the deep oceans, track rapidly moving storms, model climate trends, protect and preserve our marine resources, and so much more. It's all in a day's work at NOAA. Find a career that makes a world of difference, enriching life through science, service, and stewardship. NOAA. University of Hawaii's Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. Healthy oceans are critical to our cultural, economic, and environmental sustainability in Hawaii. The ocean serves as a source of water, food, medicine, jobs, transportation, recreation, and energy. It controls climate and weather. Kosi Island Earth aims to share this ocean awareness by partnering with local scientists and educators to engage communities and schools in active science learning for an ocean literate population. Kosi Island Earth is working to establish new avenues for connecting research scientists with educators and communities. Kosi Island Earth is enhancing the science and ocean literacy of our island residents and visitors. Kosi Island Earth is connecting scientific research, traditional knowledge, and ocean policy. Kosi Island Earth, bringing together university, government, research, and community partners to improve science education and ocean stewardship in Hawaii.